I know it's early. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Ah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, what do we think about when we think of climate change? Well, you could think about another disaster movie with John Cusack. You could hear Al Gore wax lyrical. I knew it. You know, it's you know, auto-suggestion. <laughs> that will rip your face off. Uh, beautiful polar bear, jumping. Um, what we see increasingly with climate change is the fact that record-breaking droughts are taking place, polar ice caps are melting. For me, climate change is this. I've recently got back from Venice, and it looks like I'm sort of dangling precariously on a little pallet truck, and you'd be absolutely right. Um, this gentleman here, uh, basically, um, I paid him one euro and I said, can you actually take me down this alleyway um, because it's flooded? And he said, that's my job, that's what I do. And so um, you basically look at your watch and you kind of think, oh, it's high tide, 8.30, aqua alta, I need to get out of here. And then suddenly you go down your favorite alleyway and you find that it's flooded. And what you'll find is people like this able to carry you and your friend on the pallet truck 10 metres before depositing you at a bridge. This is the reality of climate change. What I'd like to do is talk to you about climate change and also kind of put this into a bit of context as to how we could address climate change in the future. Before I go there, have any of you heard of the term opening up a can of worms? Yeah, okay. So how about opening up Pandora's box? Okay, let me, for those of you not familiar with the opening up of Pandora's box, give you a bit of an insight. This beautiful pre-Raphaelite woman is Pandora. Now, obviously, Pandora wasn't around in the pre-Raphaelite era, but she was actually created by the gods of Olympus. She was the subject of clay being molded from the earth to create this beautiful evil, according to to the god of gods, Zeus. Now, what he did, he basically um, said, do you know what, I'm really going to punish you, um, Prometheus, because you've stolen fire from Mount Olympus and you've given it to man. The first technological bit of ingenuity for man, fire, wow. Now, I'm gonna punish you. I'm gonna punish you and man. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create Pandora and I'm going to marry Pandora to your brother, Epimetheus, and I'm going to give them a wedding gift. Cue the box. So, what happens when you give somebody a box and say, don't open it? <laughs> yeah, she opened it. And basically, what we now have the term, opening up Pandora's box, is reference to the fact that we can create these wonderful marvels, real technically brilliant ideas that become products, fantastic processes that become these wonderful gifts. But sometimes we become so fascinated with the end product, we forget about the evils that could actually be contained within. Robert Oppenheimer, Manhattan Project, fantastic scientist, very, very young scientist to be able to control a very large, unwieldy scientific team in the creation of the first weapon of mass destruction. This was his Pandora's box. He became so fascinated with the end result, he did not think about what his actions would eventually be. Effectively, this 
weapon of mass destruction killed more people in one go than 200 years of previous warfare. And this is what he said. When you see something that is technically sweet, you go ahead and do it, and you argue about what to do about it only after you have had your technical success. That is the way it was with the atomic bomb. This was actually taken from the Reef Lectures during the 1950s on the BBC. So that was his Pandora's box. That was the Pandora box moment. Today, our Pandora's box in the built environment industry is climate change. What we're constantly finding is that 86 million barrels of oil are consumed on a daily basis. That's like filling five pyramids of Giza. Between 2000 and 2008, Asia greenhouse gas emissions went up 97%, whereas the rest of the world, it went up 18%. One year can consume a million years of fossil fuel. So the cataclysmic effects of climate change is all around us, especially when we consider the fact that by 2050, our population is expected to increase from 7 billion people to 9.5 billion people. We are going to need more fuel. We are going to constantly find ourselves and our consumer society gobbling up more stuff. Currently, 50% of our global, global carbon emissions are caused by the built environment, of which a further 80% of that 50% is caused by the cities that we design. So, needless to say, we're in a situation where the cataclysmic effects of what we're creating are starting to have a huge impact on our natural environment. Record-breaking droughts, flooding, the frequency of flooding increasing. So what this has meant is that governments have come up with far-reaching legislation to try and make sure that climate change is kept at bay, trying to put a lid on Pandora's box. In the UK, by 2016, all new residential properties will need to be carbon zero. That is just one example of many methods that governments are trying to put the lid back on Pandora's box. So I guess what this means for the built environment industry is that we become very, very focused on the end product and sometimes not realising the effects that we have on the built environment. I like to kind of compare it with the research of Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, who spoke about animal laborers and homo faber. Animal laborers, the laborer who does. Homo faber, the worker who thinks. Now when we think about this in terms of the built environment industry, we can become so fixated with creating these buildings without actually thinking about the results of that. Just get the job done. Let's just get it built and worry about the consequences later. That is the sort of animal laborer's laborer who does ideal. Or you've got Homo Faber, who wants to constantly live in fantasy land, the ability to think outside the box, but do any of those ideas ever actually become realized? How can we ensure then that we can actually balance between the two? How can Homo Faber learn from animal laborers? How can animal laborers learn from Homo Faber? How can we take the unresolved ideas to the resolved and vice versa. How can we ensure that there is a balance in the built environment industry? In many respects, what we see is that we are now starting to get to a point where legislation is maneuvering designers to become more sustainable in their thought processes. And just as well, really, because if we don't, we're going to see continued cataclysmic effects of climate change. And the more we design technically innovative solutions without thinking about its consequences, the more problems we're going to face. Thankfully, there is a way that we can be looking to the past in order to inform what we do today. I guess the best analogy is this. Once upon a time, we had caveman sitting at the mouth of the cave. Now, 
when we discovered fire, we moved slightly deeper inside the cave. The only problem is that we've been moving deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper inside the cave for many, 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 many years. We've become so technologically advanced that now, as we've become thinking man, we're creating wonderful tall structures that are maybe actually quite gas guzzling. What we need to do is return to the mouth of the cave. Can we go back and embrace natural light, natural ventilation, and actually balance that with technological ingenuity? Again, bringing animal labrums and homo faber together. That'll be our light bulb moment. And in many respects, some of the best lessons learned have actually been already built. One of the best examples of zero carbon development already exist. This is the traditional kampong house of Southeast Asia. Deep overhanging roofs to provide shade and shelter from the sun and the rain. Lifted up on stilts to stop the creepy crawlies going in. Nice cross ventilation. Slightly loftier roof voids to allow air to percolate in and around the internal spaces. This is an example of zero carbon development before the rise of technology, before our irritable reaching for the air conditioning switch or the light switch. But we did have the ability, and we still, as technologically advanced individuals like yourself, have an opportunity to reinterpret, uh, reinterpret some of those lessons from the past. This is the Idea House, it's the first zero carbon house in Asia. It may not look like a kampong house, but it bears the essence of the original structure. Narrow floor plates, open plan living that allows an opportunity for the building to expand and contract according to the size of the family. It generates 20,724 kilowatt hours of energy per year. That is more than the average family can consume. It's almost a power station in itself. The owner would never have an energy bill again. It was 98% water efficient. The only reason we didn't get the last 2% is because there was this perception in everyone's mind that they didn't want to drink recycled water. Go figure. I think we all drink recycled water. So 98% was actually the rainwater harvesting and the grey water harvesting. And this house was actually built within a 12 week period. So basically a lot shorter time frame than the average 14 months. We're doing something very similar in Singapore now, though going beyond carbon zero to becoming carbon negative. What this allows us to see is an opportunity to once again reinterpret past traditions. If the idea house was a reinterpretation of the kampong house, this is the reinterpretation of the black and white bungalow. And at a larger scale, Nova by Century in the Philippines, a carbon zero public realm. Okay, um, anybody know where these two places are? I just, just heard a mumble. Sorry? This is actually Venice on the, but I like the way you think. And the other side is Singapore. Now, um, as a professor of sustainable design, I was invited kindly by UAV, the university uh, in Venice, um, to um, hold a workshop um, just a few days ago, actually. I've just got back. Slightly jet lagged. That's why I can be with you so early in the morning. Um, and I'm thinking, well, what on earth do these two places have in common? Well, basically, both of them were entrepots for trade and commerce. Singapore on the left-hand side, rubber, tin, uh, silks in Venice. But they could not be <laughs> any, any similar. I mean, they are incredibly different in terms of the architecture. You've got the gleaming high-rises of steel, glass and concrete that one imagines should be a symbol for a global city. And you've got a, an effectively a museum of nostalgia for Venice caught in a time warp. But there's still a lot of trading going on. I mean, whether it's the various uh, shops trying to fleece you uh, for a price of an ice cream, 
or the bankers in Singapore. Basically, trade is at the heart and soul of these two great island cities. So I was actually brought over to uh, Venice to undertake a sustainable design workshop. And I thought, well, the one commonality between the two is water. And if we're talking about climate change, we better really focus on water, maybe waterborne communities. So, water, water everywhere, and love it. Oh, you educated bunch, you. You're absolutely right. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Coleridge. The idea was that, uh, I guess he was kind of a nice guy, but then he turned not very nice. I mean, he shot an albatross that was actually guiding the seafarers to safety. And then all of a sudden, nasty things started happening to that boat. And the sailors hung the albatross around his neck. A very penitent man, very sorry for the death of the albatross, but only after the accident had taken place. This was his Pandora's box, I guess. So I guess for the built environment industry, climate change is our albatross. And it's hanging around our necks, and we've got to be very responsible in being able to deal with that. He eventually managed to allow the albatross to drop free from his neck when he started praising nature that was in the water. I think it's something along the lines of slimy, crawly things in the water. I can't remember the actual words. But he actually found beauty in nature. And all of a sudden, the lid on Pandora's box was closed. So this is what Venice was like. Pretty flooded. I was literally looking at my watch thinking, <gasps> 8.30, high tide, I've got to take this particular route in order to avoid particular areas. So as a wonderful setting, it couldn't be more pertinent than Venice for us to be designing a waterborne community. Now, when we think about waterborne communities, they're not just isolated to Venice. After all, many of the cities that have been created, if not all, have somehow been associated with lakes, oceans, or rivers. After all, it is their opportunity for trade and commerce and mobility, ease of movement, circulation. But what we increasingly find in and around the world is the rise of these waterborne communities, whether it's actually through trade and commerce or tourism, or even just the increasing population expansion through asylum seeking, or just handling inner, dis inner city densification. If we're increasingly densifying our cities and it's becoming more expensive to live in the city centre, we're finding an increasing swathe of individuals wanting to opt for a different lifestyle and moving to waterfronts. So that was our brief to the students. What we wanted them to do was actually think about a waterborne community. If Venice all of a sudden had a role reversal from the 60,000 people that currently live there, which is not a lot. I mean, in, at the height of Venice, if I'm not mistaken, it was about 250,000 people living there in the golden age. Um, today, though, there are three million tourists that pass through the city every year. It's really quite remarkable. But the assumption being, if we can create a waterborne community that is actually floating out on water, could this also be an answer to increasing flood risk? And how could you take those ideas and apply them elsewhere around the world? How can we design something that is modular in nature, nature that can be then interface into a hub, a docking station, if you will? Your waterborne floating homes, offices, hotels, whatever, could dock into a hub that could be a port of sustenance, which could then be connected to the mainland. The mainland connection could also be a source of energy, of technology. And so in a two-week period with the University of Venice, with James Cook University, with Raffles Design Institute, we got them working on their group projects. And this is what they did. One of the student groups which is, inter and interestingly enough, made up of 
not just architects, but also psychologists, environmental scientists. It was a real mixed bag of individuals. One group actually took inspiration from the seaweeds in the lagoon, and they wanted to do something that was slightly more leaf-inspired. Basically, it was a connection from the mainland with a series of these modular floating pods that would actually be the hotel accommodation for tourists. In this scheme, another group wanted to try and create something in line with the Venice Biennale. They were complaining that there was no good food around the Venice Biennale area. They were kind of saying, you know, we go there and there's like two cafes and the sandwiches weren't great. So what they thought was, why don't we create a series of modular pods that could also be a source of food growth? Why don't we actually try and create vertical farms? And allude to the historic architecture of the place in these sort of slightly pitched um, houses that would allow air to percolate along the waters of the lagoon and then vent out through the top. And each one of these pavilions would actually be a dining area with a central little atrium space that would grow different types of vegetables for various different types of cuisine around the world, thus tying back into the international flavour of the Biennale. Another group thought, well, actually, this is a perfect venue for regatta training and rowing, so why don't we actually create a rowing community? And so what they created was a series of pods that float out onto the edge of the lagoon, a hub that is basically the training centre, and a regatta starting point. All of these ideas within the two-week periods were also backed up by a rigorous understanding of energy generation, renewable energy sources that would actually allow these places to be self-sustaining. So it wouldn't be fair for us not to kind of impart what we did on that site, also in Venice. Our cue was the traditional garden city. Ebenezer Howard's concept of the garden city of the future blended technology industry with living. This radial form of town planning actually came into existence in Canberra, in Australia what we find is that there are these epicenters, almost like ripples in the water, that allowed for the growth of the community in a radial fashion. So we picked a site just off the Isola La Cartossa. Forgive me, Italians in the audience, who knows that my pronunciation is absolutely rubbish. Michele. Well, what we have is a wonderful site that allowed us to explore the idea of a life ring, a life boy, something that gives an individual some hope of recovery. This was then blended with the idea of a molecular structure that could expand and contract according to society's needs. If all of a sudden there was an expansion in the population or an expansion in a particular sector or discipline, hospitality or retail or office. The molecular structure will be able to grow accordingly. So taking the idea of the life ring, the molecular structure, gave rise to our pog and play. We're playing on the words of plug and play, but literally the idea is that these individual pogs, or an acronym for pod off grid, self-sustaining homes, could actually then be expanded upon in the future according to social need. What we increasingly find in the traditional city is that there is the open square, the tower for an understanding of where you are and where you're going, and the sense that the traditional city is constantly under risk of urbanisation. What we were suggesting is that you can bring some of those qualities out onto the water. This life ring basically becoming the new hub, a new epicenter for life out onto the water with the residences that could then plug into the center. 
It could be adaptable. This could expand and contract according to societal need. One will be able to make connections with other hubs in the future. One could also see how the residential may not always be terraced form or semi-detached or detached, but actually may be tower orientated. It could be modular. The idea that it's a Lego kit of parts, but on a larger scale, so that it could be applied in different configurations to create different patterns for society to live. It will embrace ecology. The greenery that one finds in traditional spaces on the ground on the mainland could be extended across the spine to then form rooftop gardens for urban agriculture. And it will also embrace renewable energy. That would be in the form of geothermal or wave energy, solar energy through the canopy, or wind turbine technology through the taller parts of the buildings. So the city square, the city square of vibrancy, can actually be reinterpreted on the water. The bridge links that one allows people to circulate back and forth and provide opportunities for connection can similarly be reinterpreted. And the houses that have grown sporadically over time but have become so constrained in the city centre could find a new expression out onto the water. Modular in nature, the detached it could become the semi-detached to the terraced and even vertically orientated. Effectively what we're creating is a network garden city, not on land, but on water, providing an opportunity for the civic hub to move the density away from the city centre where there's overcrowding, to create a network on the water that will allow for a self-sustaining community, targeting floodplain areas around the world. Your pog and play could very well be at home in Dakar as it is in Venice, Amsterdam and the Maldives. But I'd like to finish on one thing. There was one thing left inside the Pandora's box. Do you know what it is? That one thing that was left in the box was hope. And I hope that we as creative professionals will be able to kind of understand the cataclysmic effects that climate change has caused through some of the products that we've created. We need to be able to learn from those lessons from the past and distill those lessons in order to be able to design for the present. And hopefully the information that we're now generating can be of benefit for future generations. It's important for us to be able to disseminate that knowledge. Thank you very much. Basically, this is something that is our own initiative. We believe that as designers, we have a responsibility. And I think that all of us should have that sort of shared common goal. Um, I honestly think that the only way you're ever going to get a sustainable product is if you have a sustainable process in place. That's why I think that forums like this are fantastic in order to be able to share ideas with a common goal to actually create better, um, less carbon-consuming products in the future, thus keeping the lid on Pandora's box. The studio actually runs three research fields. Uh, one of them is in zero energy development, Q. 
Uh, the other one is in Vertical Urban Theory, which looks at the role of sky courts and sky gardens, which was my research of eons. Um, and the third one is in modular construction. So what's curious about this project is that it kind of brings those various strands together. The role of sky courts and sky gardens for urban agricultural and vertical farming. Uh, modular construction with the uh, rise of, um, uh, with, with population increase and the need for rapid housing. So the ability to kind of house people within a six month period for instance. Uh, and then zero energy development with the need to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, the, you know, the adoption of renewable energy sources. So um, there have been one or two projects in the past that has received government funding. But this particular project is completely um, self-initiated by the studio. But there's hope yet, isn't there? <laughs> I guess we just need to be hopeful. Uh, I just had a question in regards to the design, um, the water design housing. Um, have you guys, I'm sorry, half foot, have you thought about um, the weather implications that are caused by putting something the, the farther it goes out from the port, how uh, people will get back into land in case there's an like, evacuation emergency? Absolutely. I mean, that's a very, very good point. That's the whole point of also it being modular. So think of it as, a, as um, when you're looking at a bridge being constructed, it's usually launched from a particular pier and it extends out in modular sections. So obviously, we will know that there is the opportunity for the spine, that bridge connection, to be tailored according to need. So naturally, when you're creating a, a bespoke product, it's not going to fit everybody. It's like me going to get a Savile Row suit, tailored to fit me, may not necessarily fit you. So what one needs to bear in mind is that the modular kit of parts should be adaptable to different areas around the world. I'm not saying for one instance that that particular idea in Venice could then be um, almost carbon copied and brought into Dakar. But the module can expand and contract and the makeup of the kit of parts can adapt according to the social and economic need of that place. What would be a constant though is the renewable energy source. I think that we can see that renewable energy is very important for us to obviously minimise our fossil fuel consumption. But once again we need to be clever. There's no point in putting a wind turbine in Singapore because there's actually no wind to generate the energy. But if we're in Bahrain, whereby the wind speeds are not too bad, we can do that. So the ability to once again have a kit of parts of uh, renewable energy sources that we can strategically pick. For Venice, good wind speeds, good solar exposure. We could incorporate solar cells, wind turbine technology, geothermal. I'm not saying we can be doing that in Singapore. Hi, I would like to come back to the ID house and the zero carbon, yes. uh, which I think is a very fascinating idea. What I would like to know is how did you achieve it? If, you want, if I wanted to build a zero carbon house, what are the key areas I should look out for? What are the tricks to get there? And also the economic impact, because ideas are always fabulous, but there, there is a cost element attached to it. And if you want major take up of a new idea, it has to somehow be financially viable. So I would like to have some more information. So I guess I'd really surprise you when I say that we've gone beyond carbon zero to be carbon negative at the same price as an average house, right? I think that sometimes we become so fixated on the end product. Oh, sorry, I'm going back to my lecture again. Um, we have become conditioned by the education system. We design buildings in a particular way. We almost know as a stock response, there's going to be artificial light, artificial cooling. We're going to put in air conditioning. We're going to put in artificial lights everywhere. We're forgetting that once upon a time, we as designers or we as builders orientated our buildings to minimize solar heat gain. We had a narrowness of floor plates to allow for very good daylight penetration. We were using site sensitive materials that had a low thermal mass. Now, our building ethos, our design ethos, our process goes back to basics. We look at the historical precedent of the Kampong House. Long rectangular building. 
we orientate it so that the shorter faces of the rectangular building are facing east and west. The rising sun, setting sun, has less surface area to heat up. Then the narrow floor plates, we open them up to allow for very good cross ventilation. Also, the height of the floors allows for enhanced daylight penetration. What this means is that for the majority of the day, you do not need to switch on any artificial cooling or artificial lighting, to the point that we had school children coming over, walking around saying, this is actually really quite cool. And I was actually thinking, oh, you mean in a, like a cool as in great sense? No, no, actually cool. <laughs> ah, all right, thank you. Uh, and, and they were kind of, um, they were saying, yeah, it's actually quite, where's, where, where's the air conditioning switch? Oh no, this is called natural ventilation. Your grandparents used to be used to this before air conditioning. So there is a way we can be designing without the reliance on these artificial methods. Another thing, go to the traditional kampong, you'll feel that it's cooler than the city. It's because of the greenery. Greenery actually helps reduce ambient temperatures. And what that means is that when you start planting the perimeters of the houses, it starts to reduce the temperatures inside as well. So basic passive design greatly reduces the energy consumption of the building, up to 50% sometimes, which means then that you need lesser renewable energy sources to actually offset your reduced carbon footprint. I think gone are the days that we think that sustainable design is costly design. It was because the buildings were designed as business as usual, and then the solar cells and the wind turbines were stuck onto it. And then when you're looking at the, the spreadsheet, you think, well, actually, these solar panels are really expensive and the wind turbines are expensive. Let's just take that out of the budget. Where are we? Business as usual. So what we're doing is actually going back to basics, reducing the energy consumption, just like our forefathers did, and then embracing technology sparingly. And that has allowed us in both the Idea House and the Bee House project to get to a typology that allows us to execute at the same price as the business as usual, but have all the benefits of sustainable tropical living. I hope that answers the question. I'm more than happy to chat afterwards as well. Great, so I think um, we have time for one more question. Hi, uh, I just wanted to find out what you think some of the Pandora's box moments or aspects might be uh, that are associated with trying to mitigate climate change and what do you think some of these sort of unintended consequences will be? That is an absolutely fantastic question. Um, I think yeah, I, can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I love the fact that, you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head. I think our Robert Oppenheimer moment is then we become so fixated on a renewable energy strategy that actually is incredibly intensive in terms of our fossil fuel depletion. That is a Pandora's box moment. Because what we're doing, we're creating wonderful um, technologies that really do serve a renewable purpose, but the backstory of that might actually be compromising what we do. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just please put your hands together for Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.